Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us on another episode of the All Might Be Edified Discussions on Servant Leadership. I'm Keith Pankow, your host, and today I'm here with a great friend and one of my chosen mentors, Regan Howe. Regan Howe is Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Monroe Energy, LLC, a refining, pipeline, and terminal company headquartered near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Regan is a chemical engineer who has spent nearly 30 years working for oil companies, large and small, around the world. He has a lifelong fascination with leadership, both studies and practice. He is married to Jen, and they have five children and five grandchildren. He's also a graduate of the University of Utah and has a degree in chemical engineering. Well, hello, Regan. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Keith. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm just so excited to have this conversation with you and also thankful that you asked it to be more of a conversation to get some of my viewpoints. And I've really made it a focus of not trying to overpower the guests because I want their voices to be heard. And so it's always an honor and quite humbling when someone of your stature that I look up to asks for my opinions to be more present on the show. So I really appreciate that. Well, you're certainly welcome, Keith. And um, you know, I, I think it goes to really the topic, the title, the name of the podcast, right? There's a great opportunity for us to learn from each other. And as soon as you think you've got it all wired, you've made a grave mistake. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And one of the prevailing themes throughout the show is, as Captain Lushan Hanna so eloquently said, you've never arrived as a leader. And I really just love that theme. And episode five also talks about that need to continually be focused on never arriving. Yeah, yeah. Well, I also forgot to mention Happy New Year to everyone listening. So as we go into the new year, please think about ways that you can align some of your goals with thinking about yourself and your progression and also the progression of those around you. Great opportunity, Keith, to reset and make some of those small one, two, five degree changes, right? That we know we can perpetuate. We know we can continue to do those. Sometimes those big step changes are, are difficult to uh, sustain, but it's a great opportunity to make small adjustments that will pay off in the long term. Yeah, I agree. And I think that there's a, a natural tie-in to this idea of never arriving and recentering or resetting goals continually, not just at the new year. The new year is obviously a great time to set new goals. And as you said, to make these slight adjustments, I think sometimes we try to take on too lofty of goals at the new year. And so we often fail, but if we're continually looking for ways to make slight adjustments throughout the year, that's when we'll be more successful. Right. I agree. All right. Well, I have this quote from a study done to look at different ways to increase leadership opportunities for graduate students. As they dove into this work, they looked at ways that a lot of MBA students were coming straight from undergraduate school to graduate school and weren't getting a lot of leadership opportunities, but they were then advancing onto careers to be hopeful leaders in the business community. So these professors from the University of Wisconsin and Washington State University, Dr. Kirsch and Dr. Peters, respectively, looked at ways that they could harness servant leadership in combination with authentic leadership, which was tied to both of those, as they mentioned, to look for ways to build leadership opportunities for these MBA students. And one of the things they looked at, they quote, developing students' leadership in a way that aligns with the leadership models of business and also prepares them for ethical behavior and decision-making post-graduation would respond to the disheartening findings that business education can make students less ethical. And so what they were saying is that many of these studies they were doing on the results of just going through education and learning about business was making students less ethical because they weren't exposed to the leadership opportunities. And so that's why they wanted to build in servant leadership. As a result, it was to mitigate these damaging effects of creating less ethical leaders. And so I don't think that it's necessarily bad to have a lack of experience because we all start somewhere. We all start with a lack of experience, whether we jump into a professional or a vocation early and we get our education along the way, like I did, or you start with your education and you get your experience along the way. I don't necessarily think there's a right fit for every person. Each person has to find that way themselves. But I agree with these professors that we have to find ways to manufacture or create or lead people in a way as they're developing to create an ethical component to their leadership or their, their participation in the business world or any organization. And so as we look at those different ways, what do you look for at your level in your organization 
to notice when people might need more course corrections or a little bit more coaching along their path? That's a really good question, Keith. And I had some great examples of that early in my career. People who gave me opportunities to lead in small ways, small projects, and start to develop some of those leadership skills. And then constant coaching by those people so that I understood how those decisions were supposed to be made, that they weren't made just on dollars and cents or the output of a formula or a model. In my career uh, or in my vocation, we use computer simulations, we use models, they'll spit out a precise answer, you know, to six or seven decimal places. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right answer. And so I try and be attuned to that with the people that I work with, uh, the people that work in my organization. You may have this engineering thing wired. You may be the best, most qualified, most certified fixed equipment inspector. But let's talk about how some of these decisions need to be made, the values and the ethics behind the decisions that we make and why we might say, yes, technically the answer is A, but we're actually going to do F or G or H because those are the right decisions for the organization, the ethical, moral, value-based decision for the organization. Yeah, that's a great thought. I was talking, I was thinking about, we often use this phrase uh, throughout many organizations about modeling, uh, garbage in, garbage out, and we'll get a number in our model with the characteristics we put in, but if those characteristics are bad, no matter what answer we get, it's going to be a bad answer. And I think the same is when we're looking for new hires or people to bring into our organization or people to retain in our organization, if we don't have the right characteristics to measure against those people, then we're not necessarily going to get the the right fit for our organization, like you said. And I also remembered I did a study on BMW as part of one of my master's degrees and looking at their culture they had this dip in sales in one of their cars and it was some of the best engineering features they'd accomplished, but they had a dip in sales. And so they looked at this and like, why are we getting better and better in our engineering, but we're selling less? Is it pricing? Is it this? Is it that? And so they really brought some people together and they realized that the salespeople didn't know how to market the features the engineers were creating. And the engineers didn't know what the salespeople were seeing and what their consumers really wanted. So the engineers came up with these fancy fixes, but They weren't necessarily what everybody wanted. So they brought their best engineers and their highest producing salespeople and they put them in a room together and they had them talk to each other about what they were engineering, what people wanted to see. And then the result came out. I don't remember which model the BMW came out of that, but the result was their highest grossing car ever made was the result of bridging those people together. And so sometimes we need to find the right characteristics of that formula with the people that we have. Oh, I totally agree. I've not heard that example. I'm a big car guy. I I love that. And as an engineer, uh, I can see how that could happen. You know, we engineers, we love to go off and create solutions, sometimes to problems that, uh, you know, may not be there or may not be as big as we see, right? And you referenced the term culture. And I'm a huge culture hawk. I believe that it's an organizational culture that really sets one organization apart from another in a competitive industry like mine. I often tell people I work with, steel is steel. Our refinery is very similar to other refineries. The thing that makes the difference is that culture and the people that are in it. And if you can find a way to get the engineers and the salespeople or different parts of your organization together, if you have a culture that allows for that collaboration and, and people to work together to achieve those organizational goals, that is a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah, I agree with that. And I've noticed throughout your career, you've moved around quite a bit and you've joined several different companies Um, oil companies and refining companies, and you've worked in many different capacities. So when you look at culture, as you move into a new organization, 
how do you mold into that culture and how do you take the good and help transform the bad? Well, I fall back on my classical science training, right? The laws of thermodynamics say that um, entropy is always increasing, right? Things always deteriorate, move from an organized state to a less organized state, unless there is work, unless there's energy input. And you never go into an organization that has no culture. There's never an absence of culture. There's a culture in every organization. The question is, does that culture help you achieve those goals? And if not, then how do you tweak that culture? Because a complete wholesale cultural change is a difficult and time-consuming, uh, you know, just Herculean task. But how can you make those tweaks to better serve the organization, to, to have the organization, organizational culture move to a state where you can better achieve those goals? And I learned a lot from one of my jobs. We had visit from a professor at Rice University, a man named D. Brent Smith. And that was one of the things that he emphasized when he was talking to us was the value of culture is not, hey, this is a happy place where you can bring your dog to work or we have a foosball table or we have free snacks in the break room. The value of culture is to bring everybody together in achieving these organizational goals. So you have to be very intentional about the culture that you create and then that you throw all your energy into to preserve, to grow, to, to perpetuate. Because if you walk away, if you miss an opportunity to reinforce your culture or to make a cultural change, entropy takes over and the organization kind of it begins to deteriorate, the culture deteriorates. And so every interaction is an opportunity to reinforce that cultural change that you want to make. Yeah, I love that thought on culture. And I think that there's a great tie into servant leadership when it comes to culture, because not every single person is a fit to every single organization. And I read this quote once, and I cannot remember the author, and I'll have to dig deep to try to find it. But it was talking about, at some point, as we look at our own progression and our own growth, we may find that we're not the right fit for an organization, or we may find we're in the wrong place for our own personal development. And it asked the question, how long do we hold ourselves and those around us hostage when we know we're not the right fit for an organization or a position? And at what point do we start to become more of that servant leader to recognize within ourselves and to recognize within others that they might not be a right fit for an organization? And how do we help them in a positive manner move on to something that they can find greater fulfillment in? Yeah, that's the constant struggle in leadership, right? Because one of the things that we all want to be compassionate. We all want to help other individuals grow, especially those of us who, you know, espouse the model of servant leadership. It's about the people that we work with. It's about the people that we have an opportunity to serve. And so coming to a point where we look at someone in our organization and say, you're really unhappy or wow, you're really not successful in that position? Is it because of the specific task assignments that they have? Would they be better in a different part of the organization? Or is there a cultural mismatch where they want to go left and our organization is going right? And in those situations, just a very frank discussion. I found a very, a very frank discussion with those individuals and saying, there are organizations that are more like the way you're acting. And so you kind of have to make a decision here. You can say, wow, I really like the way that my current employer addresses the goals that they have as an organization. I realize I'm not a fit. And, and do I need to change? Does that individual need to change their outlook? Do they need to change their view? Do they need to change their behavior? The flip side of that is, you're right, I, I really don't want to go right. I want to go left. And so I need to go find an organization 
or maybe I need a little bit of a nudge to go find an organization that's going less. Yeah. And that can be very challenging to step out of your comfort zone to have those difficult conversations and to, as Trevor talked to us last week, show our vulnerability a little bit, both as a leader and to invite that person to show their vulnerability a little bit more. But I think it's really important to create that mutual understanding and to understand enough about your people um, that you work with and those that are around you that you know when it's not just a something going on in their life, but it really is a culture mismatch because that can be very hard to see if you don't know your people well. If it's it could be they experienced a in their life, they're going through a hardship, maybe marital discord, family troubles, trouble with a child, uh, death of a parent or a loved one, all of these things can manifest themselves as potential cultural mismatches, but they could just be a, a life event issue and or a trauma. And so understanding our people well enough to recognize that difference is very vital. It really is. And just to get very here and now, very topical, Keith, I see after almost two years of COVID or pandemic response, I think we're going to continue to see the emotional and mental health effects of the response to the pandemic. And again, as leaders, is this something that's brought on by COVID fatigue or the loss of a family member or a friend? Is this person's behavior brought on by some of those things or or is it really a cultural mismatch and your point is spot on we do need to know our people if we're going to truly be servant leaders we need to know our people and we need to be able to have those conversations with them they need to feel while vulnerable they need to feel some measure of safety that we're going to treat them with understanding with compassion with love and and say hey you know i want you to be successful and i would love for you to be successful in our organization but these are our goals and this is our culture and your behavior right now doesn't necessarily line up with that so you can change or i can help you find something that might be more fit with with where you are and give them the opportunity you know if it is a life event if it is depression or anxiety brought on you know mental health crisis we can work through that once we identify what it is but you know it it gets back to this is the way our organization is going and we'd love for you to be part of it but we're not going to change course because you'd like to go left Yeah, that's great. And I think there's a couple of things there, you know, first and foremost, knowing your culture and and being intentional about your culture that you know where you truly want that culture to go is super important so that you can align people to it. But also, I love that you brought the law of entropy into the discussion because it's true. Everything is always wasting away and we have to add to it, whether it's an organization, whether it's a person, whether it's our culture, whether it's our own path. We always have to be mindful and intentional about growing it and developing it in a way that is true to ourselves and true to the path that we want to go, but also harnesses people in a proper way. And I think there's times when people are just not a fit for a culture, and that's when we need to take action for our organization and for those people so they can progress to become their highest versions of themselves. But there's also the component of we need to also learn to be a little less rigid sometimes and more flexible and adapt ourselves to what is needed so that we can grow as individuals as well. And I think about Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning as he experienced the horrible traumatic events of living in a concentration camp, he formulated this idea and later a book, which is phenomenal, talking about how, you know, our circumstances aren't necessarily what contribute to our attitude or define us. It's how we define ourselves and search and use those circumstances to harness our ability. And even his experience in a concentration camp, which was very traumatic and awful, he harnessed for a good purpose and to show him a path and to strengthen his faith and to strengthen his own character. And I think that cases, it's not that we're not a right fit. It's that we're just not 
flexible enough to learn and grow to become a right fit. And we might be a little too rigid. We do have to be willing to learn and willing to change. That happens regardless of your level in the organization. (laughs) I'm reminded daily of places where I need to be a little more flexible or where I need to counsel with or consult with people who have a different set of experiences or a different set of viewpoints. And certainly the conversation about man's search for meaning, man's search for happiness and Viktor Frankl's experiences. Sometimes we can kind of put our heads down and we see all the things that we have to do. And, and we, there is a tendency to let our circumstances dictate how we act or and say, you know, I, I can't do anything different. I can't be different. Well, it's possible that you can. It's possible that you can accept the things that are around you and continue to move forward based on your values and your intent. And you know, maybe the circumstances will change, maybe they won't, but at least you're being true to those values and those ethics that you espouse. Yeah, I think that's super important. And it can be exhausting to <laughs> realize that everything's always wasted away and I have to continually work at these things. And I am completely aware that a lot of these things that we're talking about can sound hard. They can sound intimidating. They can sound exhausting. Just thinking about all the work that we need to do. And especially if you're somewhat of a perfectionist, like I am, it can feel daunting when you sit before the mirror and you truly start to understand your weaknesses, where you can change your own rigidness and to open yourself up, to be more vulnerable, to allow those good components of the culture and other people within your organization to influence you in a positive way and to allow the gifts of diversity to truly manifest themselves in your life by harnessing the good that you see in other people and in the organization that you work for. But that's not an easy task. It's easy to talk about. It's not easy to put into practice. And so we need to look for ways to ground ourselves to to realize when we're just facing too much or trying to take on too much And that's another component to make us look like we're not fitting into the culture where we might just be overwhelmed. That's a great opportunity for us to also look at our organizations and look for the way, what is the culture or the environment that we foster within our organization that allows people to experience their vulnerabilities from a place of trust? Yeah, that is really important. And I love things that some of your other guests have talked about, Keith. You know, we talk about servant leadership and how can we serve those in our organization. But, you know, servant leadership is is the model that I personally have chosen. What I'm trying to do then is share that model and have others adopt parts of that model for their own leadership. I don't get to see, I don't get to communicate with the others in my organization, the refinery operators or the pipeline operators or the machinists who are working on the pumps. I don't get to talk to them every single day. But I do talk to people who do talk to them every day. And so I have my role that I have to fill in putting work, putting energy into the system. And then the interesting part is how do I get my direct reports to espouse some of those principles of that servant leadership model and share that within their organizations? And overall, Again, we're trying to move this entire organization, in my case of you know around 500 people, we're trying to move in a certain direction because we've said, all right, these are our organizational goals. And we believe that the principles of diversity, the principles of servant leadership, principles of continually putting work and energy into the system, that those are all important for us to achieve those goals. And there are some great models of organizations that have done that. You know, one of my favorite books is, has the really exciting title of Let My People Go Surfing. It's a book by Yvonne Chouinard, who's the founder of Patagonia. And I love the idea that I think the subtitle is something about the education of a reluctant businessman, because he said, you know, he said his intent was never to create this high-end outdoor clothing brand. And he's not a big fan of 
capitalism and business in general. But he had this goal for his organization. He had these things that he wanted to do. And he's been able to create this organization and be successful in business while still staying true to those values and principles. And I suspect that that's included some, if you will, bad hires, you know, people who either had to be encouraged or encouraged to leave or shown the door. It just impacts every aspect of your business, who you hire, how you train, what kind of training programs you do, who you promote, who you don't promote, how you handle salary administration. All of those things get wrapped up into every one of those interactions is a chance to either perpetuate and sustain and build your culture, or if you do it wrong, it detracts from your culture. Yeah, and I think looking at Yvonne Chouinard, he's just such a great example of someone who is true to himself. And even as you look at some of his philanthropic work that he's done and a lot of the ways that he's sold off assets and he's been really built these great environmental refuges in many countries to really harness this environment that he tries to serve through his outdoor company. I think he shows that his culture isn't just talking points. It's a culture that he believes in, he lives it, and he's really willing to make sacrifices to give back to that culture. Those are components that we could all learn from. Absolutely. And you, because as we were talking earlier, because it is hard, because it requires constant work and constant input, that decision about culture and values of your organization, you've got to be in a hundred percent. You know, you've got to push all your chips to the center of the table there, Keith, because otherwise you can't get up in the morning and go to work one more time and have one more conversation about a culture that you don't believe in. And Yvonne Chouinard is a great example of that. There are many great examples of that. But when people define those values, those ethics, that culture that they absolutely positively, they will get up every morning and they will throw all of their effort behind that because they really believe that's the right thing to do. It's amazing how powerful that is in an organization. Yeah. And ideally we'd hire the perfect people for our culture. And that's just never going to be a hundred percent, no matter how good our human resources departments are and how attuned they are to our (laughs) culture. There's never going to be a hundred percent fit model for hiring perfectly to fit a culture. And even in the Coast Guard, you know, we don't have competition as we've talked about before, like you do, um, but we do have kind of a competition in the hiring game when it comes to the other military services or other humanitarian organizations. And so our missions are very unique when it comes to the military. And we need to find people that really aspire to those humanitarian set of missions and those life-saving goals that we have, which are can be very different than the goals of the Department of Defense, not that their goals are bad, but our goals are just different. And so the people we want to bring into the Coast Guard We want to be aligned to those goals and we have some work to do on finding that 100% model, which we're never going to find perfectly, but I think we do a good job of living our culture in a way that invites people that want part of that culture. But where we really fail, and we've been talking a lot about this as an organization, is that we want to be the premier maritime service for all backgrounds. We want everybody to see that they have a place in this organization. And because historically, the military hasn't been great at bringing in people from all backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities, races, gender preferences, and and sexual identity, um, all these different things we've struggled with over the years, we find that we have a hard time communicating to people that our culture matches them. And as you go out and you look at ways to get the right people, I think part of that is showing before the hiring process that your culture is a certain type and fits all the people around. So how do you market your culture prior to hiring? Certainly it's a challenge that we face because as an oil refinery, we typically don't get good headlines. People don't come and talk to us when everything is good. People come and talk to us when there's an environmental incident, when there's a safety incident, when gasoline prices are high. And so we have to have a culture that our current members 
are ambassadors for. They have to say, hey, Monroe Energy is a great place to work. I come from this background, or I see people, and and Monroe Energy is a good place to work, or I see people like me in leadership positions. I feel comfortable bringing my experiences, my identity to this organization, and I know that it will be valued. But again, that's one of those things that there's constant work in there, Keith, you know, Every time someone asks me a question, every time someone passes me in the hall, it's an opportunity either to perpetuate or to detract from that culture that we're trying to create. And I think one other thing that came to mind as you were speaking is that there's going to be a certain number of new hires, a certain number of additions to our organization that they may you know, cultural fit may not even have been in their calculus as they were trying to decide whether to come to work or not. You know, in the Coast Guard, someone may just stumble upon a Coast Guard recruiter and say, hey, this is the direction that I'm going. I, I've never been to sea. I've never been in anything bigger than a rowboat, right? But, but I'm going to join the Coast Guard and it seems like a, a decent thing for me to do at this phase of my life. Well, how do you take that person and help them see that there is a career for them. There is a way for them to contribute to those organizational goals. In our case, we're one of only four refineries in the Northeastern United States. So if somebody wants to live somewhere between Philadelphia and DC or New York and DC, and they're in the refining industry, they may have to come to work for us, even not knowing anything about our culture. And so how do you take someone who kind of stumbles into your culture, stumbles into your organization, and then help create that cultural background, that cultural foundation, or that cultural framework for them to build their career around? Yeah, that's a great thought and very challenging question. And that law of entropy that you talked about and using every opportunity, every encounter, every interaction as an opportunity to solidify and strengthen your culture and people's connection to it, I think is such a valuable principle to focus on and to highlight throughout this podcast. That's true. If we don't intentionally go about our culture and our organizational structure and where we want to move as an organization and how we want people to align to it, then we're guilty of allowing people to stray from that culture and to go off in a way. And we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our organizations, and we owe it to the people within our organizations to be more intentional about those interactions. Yes. Yes. Well, I think for this week's challenge, moving forward, I just love this idea. If you are in a position where you can influence your organizational culture, think about how you can be more intentional about your culture. And if you feel that you're not in a place where you can influence your culture, which I think all of us can influence it to a capacity, but sometimes that capacity might be very small. And so if you really feel like you don't have an influence in your culture, think about your values, where you want to go as an individual and how it aligns to your company's culture or your organizational culture. And if you don't know your organizational culture, maybe it's a good time to learn it and see where you fit in that grand scheme of things and how you can either mold and grow with that culture, or if it's time to think about other options, take on one of those two options, depending on where you fit or If you feel like you can do both and you want to do some self-reflection and really put that law of entropy into play and really consider how you are wasting away or growing, you know, think about all those things in conjunction. Now, I've just had a great time talking to Regan and I could talk to him all day, but I'm sure everyone has their own listening capacity. So Regan, any final (laughs) thoughts before we wrap it up today? No, uh, well, yes, I echo those challenges, Keith. And Frankly, I accept that challenge to rededicate myself to being intentional about those interactions in my own career. But again, it's back to the the name of the podcast. This is an opportunity for us to talk together and to learn from each other. And the whole model of servant leadership, the ability for us as leaders at any level in the organization whether you're the top dog or you're a frontline supervisor 
or your crew lead, whatever it is, the opportunity for you to lead by serving others and, and that whole concept of doing the right thing for the one. It's so important. And I'm so glad that, that you've created an entire podcast and creating these conversations around leading by serving. So thank you. Well, thanks, Regan. And I definitely appreciate your influence in my life. I love that succinct way that you put it, the serving the one and serving to lead. And that's what we hope to achieve here. And we really hope that you will continue to listen, that you'll share this podcast with others out there listening, that you'll rate and review the podcast so others can find it. I really want people to envision themselves in these examples and these conversations and to really sit down and to do the mental work required to become a servant leader, to think about how you want to grow and how you want to become and how you want to influence those around you to become the best versions of themselves, not the best versions of ourselves, but the best versions of themselves. And that takes a little bit of work and a little bit of effort, but we invite you to join us on this journey as we continue to work diligently to minimize the law of entropy, to continue to propel ourselves forward so that we do not deteriorate as leaders and as servants. And thanks again for joining us on that all might be edified discussions on servant leadership. Have a wonderful day.